Tiger, thank you for giving my lecture. But I'll add a few points. Now I understand why the Kotler Marketing Group was rated number one in marketing consulting. McKinsey was number two. So we are proud to be here. And I want to say that today is a very special day, not only for us, Milton and myself, but for the world. What happened today? A trade deal was signed between China and the United States. It's not a complete deal, but it's a win-win thinking. Trade deals never work. Not tra I mean tariffs never work. We need to work together, and the evidence is, look at the stock market today. The stock market is now 319 points higher because the news came out that we have a new deal, and I hope it gets better and better. Why shouldn't the two leading countries in the world, China and the United States, be partners in building more economic growth to solve the problem of poverty, of hunger? Our goal must be to make it a better world for everybody. I just really, I published a new book. September 30th, I just published a book called Advancing the Common Good. Common good, not the good of the billionaires, not the good of one group, but how do we think about increasing the happiness of everybody and the prosperity of everybody. So let me share with you some thoughts. First of all, China's growth has been amazing. I was here four times. I was first here in the year 2006. You were just beginning to really start understanding not just politics, but business. And then I came in the year 2009. Why? Because there was a recession, a worldwide recession. And the, when I came, I shared my ideas through a book that I wrote called Chaotix. Chaotix. And that book is describes what you do during a recession. How do you manage your resources in bad times? I came back in 2014, and I worked with Tencent, and I worked later with Hire, that brilliant company, Hire, which is giving us a new decentralized model of business. And then I was here in 2015, so I'm very happy at the progress that China is making. Now, there's three things I can talk about. The history of marketing, today's marketing, and tomorrow's marketing. Just to tease you a little bit about tomorrow, it is possible that the consumer and the buyer become so smart that we don't need salesmen and we don't need advertising. The internet allows a customer to learn so much, not only just the internet, but the Facebook and talking to others, the customer knows what he wants and should buy without a salesman 
and without an ad. Now, what is marketing in the future if there's no need for salesmen and no need for advertising? I guess it leaves marketing one job, to manage the word of mouth. The most effective advertising comes from friends, people who've experienced the product, and you can trust what they say about their experience. And we're even beginning to learn new methods of managing or influencing word of mouth. I can give you an example. Suppose I make wine, I'm introducing a new wine in the market. The best thing I could do is find out who are the influencers of wine choice. And I will find that there are certain people who are respected for knowing so much about wine and having such a wine network that I will present a gift of my wine to an influencer and hope he likes it, because if he not only likes it, but loves it, my job is done. I don't need advertising, I don't need salesmen, and I'm not even paying him. He is so happy with the wine, he's happy to talk about it. So, Marketing will change. Marketing will change. And let's go back a little bit. Uh, a little bit on the history uh, of, of marketing. Let me just say, before we talk about this, that marketing is a young discipline, not more than 115 years old. The market itself is millions of years old in the sense that people often had something in surplus that they wanted to sell. We've always had the word markets. You go back to ancient Greece, and they called it the agora, where the people got together to buy and sell. Selling has been around since Adam and Eve. Ever since the snake convinced Eve to convince Adam to eat the apple, we had selling. But selling is only part of what became marketing. Selling is simple. The product already exists. Your job is just to find customers. Marketing is more important to decide whether you should make the product. What should you make? What are you good at? What markets have a need that you can satisfy? Once you make the product, of course you use salespeople and advertising and, and pricing. Now, this chart, and I hope you have a copy of it, because I won't go through the details, what it shows is that marketing is a very changing field. New ideas, new concepts come up. And you can even do it by decade. That's what I'm showing you, uh, the growth of marketing theory. The reason I write my new mar marketing management book every three years is because so much has happened in short times in the way of new examples and new concepts of marketing. Now, I would say that um, I will, here are some of the changing ideas in a more simple form. When we started, we thought the main thing is to make a good product. Just talk and talk and talk about your product. Finally, Procter & Gamble and Unilever and other companies said, that's not the best focus. The best focus is on the customer and what the customer needs and wants. So go from being product-centered to being customer-centered. And then we moved into this fantastic idea of branding, that if you are going to be successful, your name has to be carrying an emotional charge. It has to be something that I want to 
there's going to be a lot of names of any product I want to buy, but I want a brand because I choose the brand that resonates with my interest. Now, let me say something about branding. Branding usually is a value proposition. Very important concept. It should express the value you are creating for customers. Now, if you don't define what, why the customer should come to you, you have a problem. In fact, the value proposition is best described as your positioning against the competitors. What is your differentiation? What are you about? Now, when I say that McDonald's has a value proposition, I want to be clear. Maybe their value proposition is good food inexpensively. Good food inexpensively, whatever it is. They don't stop with that value proposition. That value proposition is an umbrella, but they have a separate value proposition for each type of customer. For the senior citizen, they're saying this is a nice, safe place to sit down and have a meal because maybe you don't have a wife uh, and you are just wanting a comfortable surrounding and a low cost for food. You need a different value proposition to get the teenager to come to McDonald's because he could go to Wendy's or somewhere else. You need another value proposition for the mother with child to come to McDonald's. So there's a lot of work in trying to create for the different groups in your market the value proposition. The main thinking that you have to do is define your target market and the value proposition. That's marketing. The target market and the value proposition. And it's done through the branding operation. Uh, what happened to marketing recently is a revolution coming out of the digital and social media, and all of you know about it, and any company that does not move into digital marketing is making a mistake. Even if you're a small retailer, depending on people to get to your store, it's not enough. You've got to let them also buy from you without going to your store. You've got to set up online so they have a choice to either come to your store or not. My own experience in my home is that my wife never goes to a store. Everything she buys, and much of it is from Amazon, is online. And she gets packages every day. Now, if that's the modern customer, that more and more people are too busy to go into stores and shop, then you've got to go digital and offer that channel to your customers. Let me move forward. What is real marketing? Marketing is, if you define marketing is having a sales force, having advertising and promotion, that is the old definition maybe of what marketing consisted of. The new view is that marketing's purpose is to create, I call it CCD, create, communicate, and, de and deliver value to a target market. And the latest view of marketing is that it is the growth function. It, it has responsibility for growing the size of the market. Why is marketing able to do, get more ideas about growth than any other function in the firm. The reason is that the marketers are the only ones who spend time with the customers, trying to get them to buy something. And as a result, they are the first to see new opportunities. If you're training your, your salespeople right, and, and marketers right, they're going to welcome an idea they see of something needed by customers that no one else noticed. 
also they're the first to sense the threats, the barriers to buying. So the job of the marketer is to be touching the real market and converting what their observations are into opportunities and threats that may happen. Now, if someone wanted a very short description of what current marketing is like, I would say five things. First of all, in your picture of marketing are customers, your company, your collaborators, partners, of course, your employees, your other stakeholders, the competitors, and then the context. We call this the five C's. Every marketing plan must touch and say things about these five C's. Now, you know that the plan starts with needing to describe your, your product, the price, the place it could be bought, and the promotion. The four P's is the starting point, but feel free to add another P if you want. Call it packaging. A perfume company knows that more important than the perfume is the packaging of the perfume. Now, you could say that that comes in the word product anyways. Packaging is part of product. Someone may say, but where is service? Where is the sales force in the four Ps? Don't be bothered that. If you need to say a lot in your marketing plan about those things, make it four Ps and one S and one W, I don't care. That's the, just the four Ps represent what you definitely need, and then if there are particular inf uh, variables, add them. The next thing is to understand, by the way, sometimes I, say the plan should have product, service, brand, price, incentives, communication, and delivery. That's a version of four Ps that is expanded for the purpose of a company in that kind of business. And then if you want, if someone says to you, what is the process of making a plan? I would say it all starts, especially if you're starting a new business or a new, uh, a new product. Marketing research, MR is the beginning of all good marketing. And there's a lot of ways to learn about a market uh, and surveys, observation, so many ways. So everything begins with MR. When you, what you will learn from MR is it's a very complicated market. It consists of groups in the market. So you do what we call segmentation, which is a skill. It will reveal quite different needs in that market. And then you target that need that you could do a good job satisfying. And that's called targeting. And then you state your position. So the language is STP. All good marketing work has to arrive at that process of STP. Now, that means you have chosen a TM, a target market. And by the way, you could choose several of them, but each one needs a separate plan. So you chose a target market, then you develop your VP, which is your positioning, your value proposition, and then you build your MP, which is your marketing plan. Now you've been into developing the plan, and now you have to implement it. I, I, it has to be taken out into the marketplace. And you, to be sure you're doing a good job, you do C, which is control. Because now you know if you got more sales or not. So here's the message, the message is, if you are not selling well, use that sequence backwards. Oh, my sales are poor. Maybe you did a poor implementation of a good plan. You hired the wrong people to implement it. No, let's say you have good implementation, but maybe your marketing plan 
set a price that was too high to buy your product, or you had poor advertising, or maybe you should never have chosen that target market because there's someone better than you in that same target market. Or you didn't even segment right. So you see how you use this process backwards to identify why you haven't been successful. Now, we heard uh, Tiger talk about the CEO and I'm going to, uh, and about the CMO. Let me say this I love CEOs, they are people charged with making a complex business very successful. I wish that all CEOs came from marketing. None of them do. Why is it that a marketing genius doesn't become the CEO? Well, they probably say he doesn't, he or she doesn't know finance or something like that. Most CEOs are from our lawyers, accountants, or finance people. Therefore, you have to ask, what does your CEO know about marketing? And there's four types of CEOs. The first type thinks price is everything. Uh, they take one thing about marketing, the price you charge, and they say that that's what you control. Well, I'd rather work for someone who is a 4P CEO, who says, my company's trying to integrate product, price, place, and promotion in a nice plan. That's better. I'd even feel better if the CEO says, I know about segmentation, targeting, and positioning, and I've really found the best targets. And then there's the highest type of CEO, and that's ME. Marketing is everything. The company's job is to create value for customers in a specific market. Everyone's job is think customer. So that is Procter & Gamble's motto. Marketing is the starting point for everything they do. So does marketing need an update today? Is the is there such a thing as the old marketing and the new marketing? Yes, there is. The old marketing was basically mass marketing. 30 second commercials. Make a very expensive but effective statement in a film, in a video, showing actual real people making a choice of your product. Now, here's the problem. If I'm not buying a car, when that commercial on a car is on my TV set, it doesn't do anything for me. In fact, it annoys me that the program is interrupted by something I'm not in the market to buy. So ma mass marketing has always been in some ways inefficient. However, you still need it. Even with the new marketing, you need to take a step where you have a 30 second commercial that gives the value proposition which is then elaborated using Facebook, using uh, uh, Instagram, using uh, uh, Google and so on. So you need to blend the old traditional marketing with the new marketing. In fact, you, you want the two so you could play with both of them. Um, but the real change is not even the marketing so much as the consumers are so smart. They can find out almost anything they want to know about any competitor and so on and so forth. Uh, the distribution channels are growing rapidly. Whoever thought you could buy food at a gas station? What a new channel that is that I can buy ice cream and milk at the gas station. More and more new distribution, new technology, other things. So let's move on. Um, some findings on growth. I prefer 
organic growth to acquisition growth. I understand when a company is doing well, it may need to buy up some other companies rather than compete them from the start. But the evidence shows that companies that grow organically without buying other companies uh, do better generally. They are companies that usually have more marketing skill and leadership. And marketing fits into the other parts of the business very well. There's good alignment. Money is allocated carefully to the products and the customers who are the best prospects. And um, there's good innovation. Right now, I'm working with an interesting company, Fuji Film. All of you know about a company called Kodak, don't you? Kodak is no longer here. Fuji Film should no longer be here either because we do not want to buy boxes and packages of film. Kodak is dead. Fuji Film is not only alive, but bigger than it was. I'm writing a book about that because what Fuji Film did to survive is a lesson for all of you who will be disrupted. Disruption is facing every company. Some smaller company coming up with lower prices that you're not paying attention to, growing in and taking some of your share. So Fujifilm will provide a lesson. And I met the president, Kam Kamori. He convinced his employees, 75,000 people, don't leave, we've got a lot of hidden technologies and we will be bigger than ever. And not only that, we're gonna be in other businesses because our technologies allow us to go into medicine, cosmetics, anti-aging creams, and so on. So I'm excited to publish soon the book we wrote about real leadership during a crisis where you lose your whole market. Um, let me move on. The main features of the new marketing. Now, I believe all of you have some copies of my slides. If you don't, of course, we will supply them. So I'm going to go on because to read a list is not that important right now, but they do describe what your company... I would use that list since it has 10 things. Look at your company and grade yourself what if you're good at all 10 things? Tell me if you're good at all 10 things. You know why? I want to buy stock in your company. You've got to be a winner if you're good at all 10 things. If not, and most people won't be good at everything, I'll be very careful in judging whether to buy your, your stock. Now, Marketing 4.0 is our latest look at how marketing is being changed by, sec uh, by the digital revolution. And one of the main concepts that we're using is called the customer journey. Now, think about buying a car. Some people, believe it or not, who didn't even think of buying a car their journey is very short because they ended up seeing a window and seeing a car in the window, going in, talking to the salesman, finding out they could get it at a good price, and they didn't even need a car. They have an old car, and they buy. That is the shortest journey. I'm not sure we could really capture that by some marketing work. Most of the time, a car buyer goes through an elaborate journey. I need a car. I'm going to watch all the car ads. I'm going to ask my friends what cars they like using Facebook and so on. I'm going to go into some dealerships. I'm going to see how they talk about the car. I'm going to also drive. I'm going to test drive the car and so on. Now, the importance of that journey 
and it's only one type of journey. There's the short journey type, there's the elaborate journey type. Maybe there's five different ways people buy a car. For each journey that you care about as a marketer, identify what we call the touch points. At what point, points during the journey is the customer exposed to you? If you don't touch the customer during the touch points, you're not in his mind. So now that's not enough to touch, it's not enough to be present at the main touch points. You gotta be present in a very effective way. What if you're good at most touch points, but the salesman is a very poorly trained salesman? You lost the sale. So you have to manage not only being at the right touch points of the journey of a customer to, to buying something, but always having the light or, or well done work at each touch point. That's what this says. And sometimes we're using an interesting version of how customers get interested in anything. Moving from aware, oh yes, I heard of that company, to I know even what their, what their um, value proposition is. I know the way they are appealing to me, but I have a lot of questions. That's where you have to really be available to say more of the right things about your product. Then the customer may be convinced to buy your product, so the customer acts, and then if they like it, you're turning the customer into a, hopefully, a lifetime person with, with customer lifetime value. They're gonna, the best type of thing that could happen, I have to say, is to turn the customer into an advocate, and we even, have a system called net promotion scoring to find out how many of our customers like us so much that they talk freely, we're not paying them to talk about us, but they can't resist telling people how, much, how good we are as a company. I give this person two names. One is, oh, that's a, a customer advocate for your company. Or I call that person a brand ambassador a brand ambassador for your company. And if that's what he or she is, guess who else should become brand ambassadors for your company? Your own employees. Wouldn't it be tragic if you have a good product, but you don't treat your, your employees well? They're angry at you. You don't pay very much. There was a time with Walmart where there was a very big issue. Working hard for Walmart, but being treated like we could replace you with others. Walmart's job became how to make them brand ambassadors. They greet people, they smile, they care. They're proud of their company. So this is a focus that has changed. It is not right to say the only marketing you have to do is to the customer. More importantly is to market to your employees. And I learned that from the hotel company called Marriott, the largest hotel company. Marriott said the customer's number two. What do you mean? The employee's number one. We put our energy into finding the best people who could be receptionists and people who take care of the, the room service and so on, because if they are good, the customer gets a really good experience. In fact, Marriott says, we're in the experience business. Now, by the way, they used to say they were in the service business. It, it was called hospitality, being a good host, being a good host. That is correct, but you're not gonna succeed unless you're delivering an experience, not just a, sub, a, sub, a service, not just a service, an experience. In fact, there's a whole field called experiential marketing. And by the way, when I go into a shop to buy something, 
Is it a good experience? Have they thought about making it a special experience? Is the clerk very quiet and not helpful? I mean, I think that if you can be best for your customer targets and best for your employees, you'll have all the ambassador work, brand ambassador work, helping you succeed. So let me move a little further. Uh, we, in the book, Marketing 4.0, we have some ratios. We'd like to know how many people who are aware heard about our appeal and value proposition. How many know the appeal but have asked certain questions that we should start answering? How many are acting on our answers to those customers? And finally, how many become advocates? And we play around with those numbers to get a sense of um, how well we're doing in the market. I'm going to use the time to just describe a few aspects that impressed me. Uh, you'll see this circle because it was developed by a very good book on being customer-centric. Two Australians, father and son, the Browns, who I met, wrote a very good book. If you're still feeling you need to think deeper about customer behavior, consumer behavior, read the book. But this is a company that uses uh, six or so dimensions that you get to get, have to be good at. The first one to notice is at the far, at the far left, I guess, called customer insight. Now, if you're going to win, you should not only have facts about customers, you should have an insight, something that's in your stomach. You know them so well. You can feel the needs they have. Customer insight. Now, in this graph, illustration, 60%. What they're saying is, we're not at 100%. We can learn more about customer behavior, but we're not that bad either. We're at 60%. But you also need brand, you need customer foresight because the customer today will change tomorrow. Where are customers moving? Are they putting more, value, more attention on price or more attention on accessibility through channels? Um, or on product features, we think that tomorrow's customer will change what, they be, what they're looking at and so on. Now, do the same for your competitors. Try to develop not only facts about each competitor, but insight into how they would behave if X, Y, or Z happens. What if I change my price? Will they match me or even go further at a lower price? I have to understand my, each of my competitors today, but I must also get customer, a competitor foresight, foresight, what they would be like to, what are, they, what are the competitors moving toward? What changes are they, I, I don't want to be surprised. I want to know what they're working on. And so another dimension is peripheral uh, vision. In other words, don't be so narrow in looking just at your customer. Open your eyes broader. View more that's at the margins of change and how that will affect you. Do more collaboration. Do more strategic alignment. All I'm saying is we have various tools, this being one, that put together a number of important things to make you uh, more knowledgeable. Um, always look for niches and micro segments. In other words, if you can spot what I call a niche, it would be a group of buyers who desperately need products of a certain kind, and someone's going to arise as the leader of that niche. If you like that kind of thinking, read the book by Hermann Simon. Uh, his books uh, talk about companies that are hidden champions. For example, you will never need to buy a big umbrella. But if you are a French cafe and people in France at lunch, they sit in a restaurant, they sit outdoors, and they need a huge umbrella, for the sun, 
there is one company they will buy that umbrella from. It's not the only one making a big umbrella, but it is the leader in the niche. There's another leader who can make the very best binoculars for the military. Their niche is all armies will buy their binoculars from that company because those are the best binoculars. So read about Herman Simon's study of so many niches and their leaders. And uh, there's another interesting book called M Micro Trends by Mark Penn, where he says there's so many groups. You could go after working retirees. What's a working retiree? That's a person who had to retire from his company, but he's still doing some work. Maybe he needs help and services, and that's a market itself. What about left-handed people? One out of seven people is left-handed. Well, maybe that causes some kinds of problems, uh, uh, and what kinds of services can you give left-handed people? And, and Protestant Hispanics, most Hispanics are Catholic, but there are Protestant ones. That's, those are niches, those are micro-markets. Watch for them, watch for them. I'm gonna skip this slide. Uh, innovation. You remember I talked about um, doing uh, about the company called Fuji Film. Fuji Film had the courage to take as their value proposition never stop innovation. That's their motto. Innovation. Never stop. Never stop. If we don't innovate, we die. By the way, if we innovate, we die too. If the innovation fails. I was talking to a venture capital company, which is a company that makes investments in new startups. And I said, how many of your startups, for every 10 startups, how many are really successful? He said, only one, one out of 10. But it's so successful, it pays for all the other nine failures. That's something to think about because your company probably cannot work on 10 innovations and trust that one of them will make up for the losses. That's what a VC firm does. But it does say that even if you innovate, but poorly, you're gonna die too. But that's no excuse for not innovating because you will surely die if you don't innovate at all. And so we can go on and say this, there, your company must need a good relation between the people who develop new products in your company and the people who are marketing. I would hate to be in a company where the developers make the perfect product, they know what's the perfect product, they never test the market. They never ask marketing for any help. And I think they will fail. In fact, what we, we did some work with the famous company called Philips, an electronics company. Philips was always inventing better products, electronic products. And many of them didn't work. Didn't, they worked, but they, they were too confusing they assume too much intelligence because they were made by engineers. Engineers are wonderful people, but they see everything as black and white. So that company realized that their failure rate was due to not having marketing in the mix. They had innovation in the mix, but not marketing. So they hired a very famous marketer named C.K. Prahalad the late C.K. Prahalad. And they said to Prahalad, help build our marketing function. And he was asked then how he wants to be paid. Get this, he said, I'm not asking for cash. So what do you think he was asking for to be pay, paid for his contribution? Stock in the company. I want Philip's stock, stock in the company. 
because I think you are so badly in need of marketing that anything I can do for you will end up with more profits and therefore a higher share price. He was so smart. By the way, never hire a consultant who wants cash. Let them depend on whether the business got better from their advice. Offer some stock, don't pay cash. In any case, if you have two types of companies, one company is very good at innovation and very poor at marketing. What do you think of that? Not good. They innovate, but it's not, they didn't ask how to actually, if the customer will really like it. What if the company is very good at marketing, but there's no innovation? That's not good either. So our, the famous Peter Drucker, the father of management, who you should read daily, any of his 20 books, and you'll see new things even though he wrote it many years ago. Peter Drucker made the point that a company's success depends on two things, having great innovation and great marketing. Not just one, but both. Those are the keys. So um, let me uh, say that, by the way, when I wrote a book called Winning at Innovation, for those of you who are going to be doing more innovation, I would ask the following six questions. Do you have activators? That is, are some of your employees always coming up with ideas? I mean, if you don't have any employees who think imaginatively about new types of products and so on, you've got to have activators. Now, keep listening to them. It would be a person who is every day saying, hey, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? Uh, turn any good idea away from him because he's not going to, he's too busy thinking of new things. He's not going to develop anything. But what he suggested, turn it over to someone else in your firm who we call a browser. That person is capable of taking that idea and studying if it's already done by any competitors. They're browsing on their internet to see if it has any form so far in, in competitors. If, if the coast is clear, take that idea to the creators. You have to have some people who can put some flesh on the new idea and design a, a prototype, a prototype of the idea. And then test the prototype. Ask customers if they would be excited by this product. Uh, they'll, suggest some improvements. Always get uh, uh, responses. And there's a, 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 an idea called lean marketing. When you're developing a new product, simplify it at first. Make a version. Put it out to some people. Get their responses. Improve the, pro the version. You'll know when to stop. You'll know when it's finally the right, fully developed process. So you go from creators who will give you some new designs to people who are going to uh, actually not only develop it in detail, but they're going to build a factory. The developers are going to make it possible for you to actually create and sell the product. The executors are the marketing people. They're going to carry out uh, that product into the market, and with the help of the financiers who have the money to allow you to pay for the advertising and the sales force and so on. So we use that model very much in the book Winning at Innovation. Um, I like the word, this idea of the three boxes. Namely, you gotta manage your business as well as possible today with the products you have. But you have to also work on some new products. Work on some new products and then maybe work on at least one big new idea, if possible. Most people never get to the third box. The third box would have been the idea of an electric car. You could always have been on the first box making a pretty good fuel-efficient car, or the second box, which would be um, a lot of other improvements on the normal fuel-efficient car. But the third box is 
maybe the future is an electric car. And that's the way Elliot, um, uh, Musk works. He dreams up brand new things. He, he wants to take us to Mars. That will pass by. But that electric car was really a creative genius act. So, by the way, uh, Tiger talked about the CMOs and he made some very good statements. I still believe CMO is the right word. For this reason, there's a whole community now of CMOs. So many companies have CMOs. The CMOs have meetings with each other, even though they're not competing. They're already, some CMOs are writing articles on how to really do the job better. They have a community. There is no community of chief growth officers. Maybe it will become a community. The other names are interesting, but think twice about whether you think marketing should be called growth instead of marketing and, or customer centricity. But make sure that someone is taking control. In the company Fujifilm, they have 12 CMOs because they have 12 companies. And there's no CMO on top of the 12 CMOs. So sometimes the CMO is running a part of the business that's different than the other parts of the business. Um, I won't say more about the CMOs. I won't say more there. An interesting book did come out on changes, shifts in the marketplace. The first was, a shift from creating just a strategy, a marketing strategy, to driving business growth. That's a more dynamic challenge. You, the CMO, yeah, you should create a strategy. No, beyond that, drive the growth of the business in all ways possible. And sometimes we used to say, and control the message. By the way, you can't control the message anymore. You're having less and less control about what people say about your product. Facebook alone allows people to bad mouth or good mouth your product. So you're not controlling the message, but you want to galvanize your network to put your message out as strongly as possible. Yes, I want improvement. By the way, I just came from Japan and Japan has, a, a many, has introduced many theories of management. One of them is called Kaizen, and they believe in it. Everyone in the company improving what they're doing all the time. At Toyota, 75% of the workers in any year, of the workers in the factory, 75% come up with something new that could make the car better, or the work they're doing on the car better. Can you imagine a culture where everyone believes that make your work better and more meaningful? Now, maybe they could do that because they, they had lifetime employment. What it meant is that some worker in Japan could say, you know, I'm being paid, but I don't really earn it. We don't even have to have me doing that. Now, that happens in many companies, that there are people in every company who are not creating customer value, or any kind of value. But we live with them because what do you, we hate, they're human beings. We don't want them to lose a job. At, in Japan, it's lifetime employment. So I am free to say my job isn't necessary, because they'll give me a different job that is necessary. So one of the concepts they introduced is called Kaizen, improving everything all the time. The other concept is, uh, oh, several uh, things about high quality. They, they gave that prize, the Baldrige Prize or whatever, for the highest quality. The Japanese love quality. Very important for China because China got into markets on low cost and average quality. 
Now, the future of China is not to make cheap products, but to sophisticate the products. Because you can make cheap products outside of China. Just go to Cambodia, Laos, uh, elsewhere to make those products. So high quality and the measures of, of uh, high quality is very important. Um, so just moving on, besides managing the marketing investment, inspire the idea of marketing excellence. And instead of just being operational, uh, have a relentless focus always on the customer and the customer's needs. It's, it's a good book uh, written by, by Scott Davis. Now, let me tell you what I think is happening in marketing and in business. The old story of business is maximize profits. If they do that, who do the profits go to? The shareholders, the owners. So the old theory was you create a business to make the, the, the one who started the business as wealthy as possible or the people who bought and financed the business to make them as wealthy as possible. So the new story is different. The new story, first of all, takes the form of maximize the welfare of the stakeholders, not the shareholders. And the stakeholders are the following. The, the, of course, the shareholders, but also the, the customers, making them better off, the employees better off, your suppliers better off, your distributors better off. So the problem becomes, when you make profits, share the profits with those who contributed to the profits. And you're gonna be better at profits if you focus on the stakeholders, because they all have something to gain. When you're only focusing on the shareholders, why as an employee do I have to care? What's in it for me? So that's, this is the new philosophy. Actually, the philosophy goes further. What is the purpose of your business? Do you have a purpose? And what are you doing about the environment? except harming the environment? Are you using only fuel, uh, fossil fuels? Uh, uh, or are you also investing in solar energy and wind energy and so on? Um, what about poor people? Do you care about them? By the way, if companies don't care about poor people or by, they don't care about low wages, who's gonna buy your products? If you don't leave enough money in the hands of people to buy necessities, you're, you're going to close your factory. So there is a little suicidal thinking when you only reward the shareholders. So the old philosophy, as I said, was, was different. Um, we think that the the movement toward a broader view of a business was originally called CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. You remember that language, Corporate Social Responsibility? That took the form of philanthropy. I'm a good business, I'm, a, I'm not selfish, I'll give a money to the cancer fund or to the Girl Scouts. Philanthropy is no longer enough, especially if your company is harming the environment. So, you, you, look, the new concept, Michael Porter was very important in developing CSV, Corporate Shared Value. Corporate Shared Value is again sharing the value with the, stakeho the stakeholders. Um, I've developed something called brand activism. Maybe I can show you what I mean. My original work on the social dimension of business was called Corporate Social Responsibility. And we studied 45 companies to see what they're giving to society, back to society. We learned a lot. Oh, we, we were very proud of a lot of the companies. 
that had a cause, that wanted to make life better in some way. It could have been to fight poverty or to fight hunger or to um, have better housing for people, whatever. Usually it was a cause related to their business because then we believe more in their sincerity if they're improving a cause that's related to their business. Now, brand activism, I just finished writing, says that you're not doing enough with your brand. Your brand is probably just talking about the value proposition, namely lowest prices at Walmart, best design at Apple. Sure, your brand should stand for your value proposition, but it should now also show your values. Your values as a as an organization. Do you care about more than just money making? So moving from just good value that you create to expressing to your public through your brand what you care about is important. And you know, when I choose a brand from three competitors, I will always lean to the one that is more ecological more caring about the world than the one that's just selling me a good product to make money. So watch for that, that your brand should be an active brand, something in charge of making the world a better place. Share what you think your company's values are. So really there's a lot of new marketing ideas. I'm close to closing my talk each one of these has happened recently. Little things like, are you seeing your brand as being about telling a story? How important it is to enliven your brand with the story of how you were created as a company. You remember how Hewlett Packard, that wonderful story about being in a garage and coming to the idea that they're gonna make ver better printers and so on. Uh, that wonderful story of hire, H-E-I-E-R, that the head of hire, when the product wasn't selling well, at the factory he had all the people come, and they were expecting just a, a talk. But why did he have in his hands a hammer? Whoever comes to give a speech with a hammer, at which point he goes and he crashes into Every refrigerator, our refrigerators aren't good enough. They remembered that. So maybe it's time for you to do that in your own company in some way. In other words, make your product more excellent and do it dramatically and tell your story. So world-class marketers are going to be responsible for company growth, for expressing the customer's values and relationship to, in relationship to the, cust to the company's values. The best thing you could say is, you know, Mr. Customer, we know your values, and there are values too. And have an entrepreneurial and innovative culture, continuous opportunity scanning and scoring, Scenario planning means imagining two possible or three possible scenarios. What would we do if there's a recession? Think about it in advance. What would we do if there's growing and growing prosperity? How would we handle that? Use big data and market analytics to get more customer insight and definitely use a combination of old and new marketing the old marketing with its commercials and so on and the new marketing and aim at achieving customer engagement and advocacy and brand ambassadorship. Because if you do that, and I'm gonna skip this, if you do that, I always say within five years, if you're in the same business you are in today, you're going to be out of business because the world's been changing and you haven't changed. So thank you very much for 
being with the Cocklers, and I wish you, I know you're the competitors of a lot of American companies, but let the best companies win. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wait a minute, Philip. Wait a minute. Okay, sure. Wait a minute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.